Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 71, The Russian Civil War. Last time, we followed Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov Lenin's rise to power of the Bolshevik Party and his ascension to the head of the Russian government. Now we will follow his journey to extend his influence and rule over the Russian people. Lenin, while head of the Bolsheviks, was still not the sole ruler of Russia. On November 8, 1917, Lenin appeared before the divided group of revolutionaries at the Congress of the Soviets and said, quote, We shall now proceed to construct a socialist order. American journalist John Reed had this to say about Lenin's appearance, quote, A short, stocky figure with a big head set down in his shoulders, bald and bulging, little eyes, a snubbish nose, wide, generous mouth, and heavy chin, clean-shaven now, but already beginning to bristle with the well-known beard of his past and future. Dressed in shabby clothes, his trousers much too long for him, unimpressive to be the idol of a mob, loved and revered as perhaps few leaders in history have been. A strange, popular leader, a leader purely by virtue of intellect, colorless, humorless, uncompromising, and detached, without picturesque idiosyncrasies, but with the power of explaining profound ideas in simple terms, of analyzing a concrete situation, and combined with shrewdness, the greatest intellectual audacity. The Congress was made up of a number of socialistic parties, but the Bolsheviks were already preparing themselves to take sole control. Trotsky was poised to take control as head of government, but he backed off at the last minute because he felt that being Jewish would have a negative effect on the Bolsheviks, so Lenin assumed the helm by popular acclamation. The first order of business, though, was the ending of Russia's involvement in World War I. Here we arrive at a nexus point in history. The war against Germany, while not going well at all on the Russian front, was certainly not going well for the Germans on the Eastern Front, although removing the Western threat could help Germany win the war. Many felt it was only a matter of time, though, before the German-Austria-Hungary side would collapse and capitulate if Russia remained in the conflict. Also, Russia stood to gain vast tracts of land as part of their treaty with Britain and France. But Lenin owed a favor to the Germans for their part in getting him to Russia in the first place. Nikolai Bukharnin, a close associate of Lenin, advocated a continuation of the war, while Leon Trotsky advocated a no-war, no-peace stance. He believed that no concessions should be given to the Germans, but that the fighting should be stopped. The Germans, for their part, stubbornly, and in hindsight, stupidly, were pig-headed in their stance for asking war reparations and demanding for land, and that it was all non-negotiable. Lenin, though, with a heavy and conflicted heart, agreed to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk on March 11, 1918, ceding most of Russia's European land to Germany, exactly eight months before the end of World War I and German surrender. So, why was Lenin so adamant that Russia pull out of the war? Well, some have suggested that the infamous train trip from Switzerland to Petrograd, set up by the Swiss communist Fritz Plotten and the German government, was the main reason why Lenin abandoned the war. I, for one, think that's rubbish. As you will see, Lenin didn't care about any deals or promises. He cared about attaining power and keeping it. Plotin, for his role in bringing Lenin back to Russia, was shot during Stalin's purge in 1944. He would not be the only old Bolshevik to meet that fate. Lenin knew that ending the war was essential to his retaining power, but oh, at what a cost. This is the first glimpse into Lenin's true colors. Was he really looking at helping the Russian people or grasping for power to push his narrow-minded agenda? You can imagine what my opinion is, because 
The amount of land turned over to the Germans was staggering. Millions of Russians were no longer Russians according to the treaty. The suffering of the people in these territories was also tremendous. But it doesn't seem that Lenin and his fellow Bolsheviks really cared. The Bolsheviks recalled the beleaguered army, many of whom were grateful to Lenin for bringing them home. Lenin would capitalize on this loyalty in the upcoming civil war. His next action would to be reining in all who opposed his particular brand of socialism or Leninism. On December 20th, 1917, he created the whole Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, also known as the Cheka, or Secret Police. Again, what was new was old, with a number of the members of the Cheka being former members of the Tsarist Secret Police. Immediately, they began to attack and shut down all opposition, not just the right-wingers, but also anyone on the left to oppose the strict Bolshevik agenda. But the Cheka kind of moved with a sort of cautious determinism. That is, until an incident occurred on August 30th, 1918. A socialist revolutionary named Fanny Kaplan fired three shots at Lenin, one striking him in the arm and another in the neck area near the jaw. While not immediately fatal, it would influence world affairs. Felix Dzerzhinsky, under orders as head of the Cheka, began systematic executions of all suspected opponents in reaction to the assassination attempt. This would be known as the Red Terror. All former Tsarist ministers and sympathizers, along with the royal family, were murdered. Bukharnin tried to curb the violence, but Lenin would have none of it. Tens of thousands of people were executed, many on lists personally signed by Lenin. This is why few doubt that he ordered the murder of the family of Nicholas II. As Ryazanovsky and Steinberg put out in their book, A History of Russia, Comprehensiveness and ruthless intolerance have been among the most salient features of Marxism-Leninism. Now, before we get to the Civil War, we need to introduce you to the aides-de-camp, so to say, of Lenin. We've already mentioned Leon Trotsky, the Commissar of Foreign Affairs, and Zinoviev. But now is the time to add two more people to the mix. First, Commissar of the Interior, Alexis Rykov and the head of national minorities, Joseph Dugashvili. I'm and you will hear as much about in the near future as you did when I did the series on Peter the Great. Who exactly is this Dugashvili character? Well, it's none other than Koba, Soso, or better yet, Joseph Stalin. Now Lenin knew he had to appease the people to keep power, so we had two major laws passed. The first on February 19, 1918, which was to nationalize all land, and the second was on June 28, to nationalize all industry. The peasants and the industrial workers felt that they were finally going to rise above their subservient positions under the Romanovs. How deluded they were. With the coming civil war, the Red Army needed food, and the central government ordered that the peasants turn over the majority of their food production to the state. The peasants were highly resistant, but quickly found out what the consequences of said resistance would entail for the next 70 years. Forced requisitioning and repression was used to get the food needed, as well as all other supplies necessary to fight the new threat. That threat, known as the White Army, was dead set on its target, the Bolsheviks and Lenin. Now, the White Army needs to be viewed in a real honest light as a group of individuals scattered and uncoordinated. The alliance, if you could even call it one, consisted of disenchanted social revolutionaries on one side and Tsarist loyalists on the other. Many of them hated each other enough that even though they had a common enemy, they so distrusted and disliked each other, they could never get it together enough to defeat the Bolsheviks in the end. Still, the threat of these numerous anti-Leninists 
were enough to pose a very serious threat to the communists' rule. By July 1918, Moscow, which had since March been made the capital again, was firmly in control by the Bolsheviks. Petrograd was too vulnerable to stay as the capital. Threats first came from Poland, which reclaimed ancient lands in the Ukraine. Next, the south of Russia was in full revolt, with early gains made by the Whites in the Don, Kuban, Terek areas, as well as in the east in the Samaral. The Urals and Ordenburg Cossacks turned against the Reds, something that would be remembered by the Bolsheviks in the future. Czech armies also came from the west. On the far eastern front, Vladivostok and Siberian forces were also revolting. Added to all of that was anti-Bolshevik aid, and it was coming into Russia from the British, French, Japanese, and America. People like Winston Churchill early on knew the immense threat Bolshevik communism was, especially the form of communism espoused by Lenin. As Churchill said of Lenin, quote, his aim is to save the world. His method? To blow it up. Bolshevik communist rule of Russia was skating on thin ice. By November or in October of 1919, General Anthony Denikin of the White Volunteer Army, once led by our old friend Kornilov, had captured the majority of the Ukraine, and it was aimed right at the heart of the communist control, Moscow. Admiral Alexander Kolchak, a Cossack commander, was trying to link up with Denikin, as was General Nikola Ayudnovic from his base in Estonia. With overwhelming odds and forces against it, as early as the summer of 1919, it is, in my humble opinion, amazing that the Bolsheviks not only survived, but would win the war. By October of 1919, a historian of the period was quoted as saying, In the middle of October, it appeared that Petrograd and Moscow might fall simultaneously to the Whites. Add to this revolts of native peoples in Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia were raging. Then you have 60,000 Japanese troops, 40,000 British, two divisions each of French and Greeks, and 10,000 Americans, and you have all the ingredients for a quick and decisive fall of the Bolshevik regime. Except, it never happened. How could the Bolshevik communists overcome such incredible odds against it? Well, there are numerous theories, some controversial, some bizarre, but there are a number of irreputable facts. I'll stick with the facts and let you come up with your own theories. First off, the Whites were totally disjointed, while the Red Army was cohesive and well-directed. To this end, much credit should be given to Leon Trotsky, who helped coordinate the army. Secondly, the foreign intervention was half-hearted, as many of the combatants were already tired of war, as many of them were veterans of World War I, and the people back in their respective countries wanted their boys back home, not fighting some vaguely defined war halfway around the world. The Red Army smartly also used the presence of foreigners on Russian soil as a rallying point to stir up a nationalistic fervor with the people. Thirdly, we have the split of the loyalty of the people. While the upper and middle class favored the whites, the industrial class heavily favored the reds, which leaves us with the peasants. The peasant class, representing the vast majority of Russia, hated both sides. The constant requisitions of food and other provisions by both sides wore down the peasants. Red Army and Cheka terror scared the people a great deal, but in the end it was the fear of returning to the old Sara system of master and serfs that had the peasants leaning, although ever so slightly, to the Red side. All of these reasons conspired to give the ultimate edge to Lenin and his supporters. With most of the major battles won, the Bolsheviks faced an even bigger threat, famine. 
The Great Famine of 1921 was mostly due to the peasants' unwillingness to sow seeds in the field, as all would become food for someone else and would be of no value to the farmer. Additionally, industrial output fell off the proverbial cliff due to the nationalization of both the land and industries by the Bolsheviks. The output of all Russian industry fell to 20% of pre-World War I production. Iron production was at a mere 2%, and cotton only 5% of pre-war levels. Horses, cows, sheep, and other farm animals were killed or abandoned by the tens of millions in response to the economic crisis brought about by communist policies espoused by Lenin and his colleagues. Things were so bad that the once unflappable Lenin himself doubted whether his government would survive this crisis. Peasant revolts reminiscent of those of the times of the Tsars further weakened the teetering Bolshevik rule. I cannot overstate the precarious nature of the crisis of 1921, as you have to realize that between the famine and the ravages of war, not only was the economy of Russia in tatters, but tens of millions of people were dead. The second time of troubles was upon Russia. But as opposed to the panicked policies of Tsar Boris Gudunov in the early 1600s, Lenin was not going to take this one laying down. Well, he kind of did have to take it lying down, as he was suffering from the aftermath of the assassination attempt on his life by Fania Kaplan. There was still the problem of the bullet in his neck, which had not been removed yet, and his weariness caused by incessant work ethic of 14 to 16 hour days. Another problem facing Lenin was the dissatisfaction within the Bolsheviks to the dictatorial rules set down by their leader. Lack of freedom of speech, along with the one-party rule, was making many chafe. Join me next time when I reveal Lenin's bold plan to pull the iron out of the fire and save his regime before his death in 1924. Now, instead of doing readings from Russian history, I'm going to shake things up a little bit. And each podcast, I'm going to do a segment on one of the characters in the episode. Not someone who deserves a whole episode on their own, but someone who had an impact on Russian history, even if a minor one. Today, I give you Fritz Plotten. Plotten, aside from helping to arrange the infamous train ride that Lenin took in 1917 from Switzerland to Russia, was an influential communist who participated in the Communist International Meeting known as the Comintern, or the Third International. This is where Lenin took control and advocated violent revolution in order to fight, quote, by all available means including armed force for the overthrow of the international bourgeoisie and the creation of an international Soviet Republic as a transition stage to the complete abolition of the state. This Congress was held in 1919 during the Russian Civil War when things looked kind of dicey for the Bolsheviks. Grigory Zinoviev served as the first chairman of the Comintern, but Lenin was the real leader. Fritz Plotten represented the Swiss Communist Party, which was also led by Bulgarian communist Solomon Goldstein. Plotten was a true radical, as he believed in Lenin's conviction that all of Europe, and eventually the world proletariat, would rise in revolt against the bourgeoisie and create a global socialist society with equality for all. But it is an incident on January 1st, 1918, that he is most famous for and why he is an influential figure in Russian history. Coming out of the Mikhailovsky Menage in St. Petersburg with Lenin, who had just finished a rousing speech in front of army soldiers, Plotin joined Lenin in the back of a car to take the men away. Quickly after that, a number of concealed assassined, assassins ambushed the car and fired numerous shots at Lenin, but Plotin quickly pushed his comrade's head down, taking a bullet in the hand, which saved Lenin's life. 
had Plotin not been so vigilant, Lenin, and likely the whole Bolshevik movement, would not have survived. While Lenin lived, Plotin played a somewhat minor role in the formation of the Soviet Union. When Stalin came into power, though, he was still involved. But when the Great Purge came about, Fritz Plotin was arrested in 1938 and sent to Nyandoma in the Arkhangelsk Oblast near the Arctic Circle in 1939. On April 22, 1944, he was shot to death, as was the fate of many of his old fellow Bolsheviks. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Now, if you're looking for a Christmas gift, you can always go to the iTunes App Store and give the gift of a Russian Rulers podcast app. Also, please join us on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast Fan Club page, where you can ask a question, make a suggestion, or leave a comment. But as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.